pay here. Um, you know, the city's growing exponentially. There's, you know, hundreds of people moving here every single day. And one of the things that the city has taken on specifically is creating real jobs, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, whenever Sweta was talking about um, her experience, you know, um, working with manufacturers, you know, we're not thinking that those are necessarily all of the jobs that are going to help you, you know, overcome your new property taxes that have increased exponentially. Right. However, <laughs> we wish. Um, right, we wish. But, um, but there are other things that people can learn alongside of that, like the high technology solutions. Mm -hmm. And so what we, um, in terms of being, um, you know, ethical, sustainable, you know, focusing on the social impact of what we can do here in Austin through fashion, you know, we really are focused on um, not just teaching people the traditional skills of how to, you know, work with a manufacturer, mm -hmm. but also what are those new high tech um, skills that are going to command um, a bit more um, for their time, um, but also reduce the amount of time that it takes for designers to get product to the floor. Okay. Um, and so the high tech, so our, the other part of that agreement is that we're working with Gerber Technology. Mm -hmm. And Gerber Technology has sunk, um, not sunk, but they have invested $13.1 million of <laughs> equipment into um, our facility. Um, we are turning into a Heartland showroom for them. They, they're actually breaking ground today. I saw it. On a it brand <laughs> new um, innovation center in New York City oh, okay. that's going to actually integrate, you know, um, waterless dye methods and automatic cutting and semi-roboticized uh, manufacturing. Yes. And a lot of these things are things that we'll be teaching our students how to do. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're kind of creating this push and pull in the market in a really unique way where we're really kind of supporting local industry by allowing them to leverage technology out of the fashion incubator, but we're also developing the capacity needed to adopt that technology in the future. Okay. And so where we're trying to bridge the gap of how do we do business today versus how are we gonna do business in the future? This is now kind of an opportunity for us to kind of start building, um, it's kind of the chicken and the egg together, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, which one comes first? You know, mm -hmm. what we need, we need the local labor force um, and a skilled local labor force to make that other component happen. And then the other part that it's traditional to an incubator is that we've got these designers in residence, um, mm -hmm. which is, you know, our small startup designers who have um, creative, goals and you know we are actually putting them through a boot camp over 12 months of you know really helping them to become saleable actionable businesses and so um you know that's the volume that our local manufacturers are going to need yeah. to to justify the investment in the new technology sounds like you could make a reality show from that we're we're, we're working <laughs> on it you'll just you wait i would watch that <laughs> come by for it. <laughs> now tell me, so the the Gerber building in New York, are they are you kind of replicating what they're doing there? That's a good question. So um, right now um, they are breaking ground on a penthouse suite. It's 19th floor um, where they're building out. It's basically going to be small incubation space. Uh -huh. um, so they're supporting emerging designers. They are bringing in local manufacturers to help them with the adoption of new technology. Um, they are also um, bringing in their full software digital package, so um, everything from product lifecycle management that allows you to manage your product from concept to sale, um, all the way to um, 2D pattern design, AutoCAD, as well as 3D AutoCAD. Okay. And the other, so I have to go into the 3D AutoCAD <laughs> yeah. portion. So Gerber Technology recently acquired Avametrics, which is a CGI company based out of Hollywood. And so what that allows them to do is in their 3D software, the avatar is very lifelike. It's the skin. Um, comes in a variety of shades. Um, More reality can, TV it's, it's stuff. Very, <laughs> it's very sci-fi looking inside the space. It's pretty cool. Um, but the fabric hangs more precisely in that space. And mm -hmm. so whenever you go to change the avatar based on your customer or your average customer or customized customer, um, you can actually use 3D scan software mm -hmm. to help upload those measurements into the 3D system, or you can actually make adjustments manually into that. So all of your, you know, your body circumference, your um, yeah. bus circumference, waist circumference, hip circumference, um, any change in your placement of your torso, all of those things get translated into the avatar. Then to take it a step further, you can actually sew the garment into the system. So after you've got your 2D pattern, you can actually sew the garment and see it 
digitally before you even go to cut a piece of fabric. So if you're working with vintage materials, you don't have to waste your, your product. Or if you're working with dead stock because you feel like that's more ethical and more sustainable mm -hmm. for you, um, that then you don't have to waste your yardage. So that it gives you a lot of options for local designers to do niche product. Um, and then you actually get a chance to send that information to an automatic cutter. So instead of you spending time on the labor on that portion, mm -hmm. you can really focus on the execution of the product after you've gone through the digital space. So you can spend more time on the, the actual yeah. stitching together and There's sewing There's so it. many yeah. steps in design. Very much so, yeah. very much so. But I think that this really allows us to really focus on, you know, um, you know the finished good and mm -hmm. how do we you know, domestically, because we are interested in being ethical and mm -hmm. paying fair wages and, you know, using appropriate materials, you know, that, that kind of, that will then beg a higher cost. Yep. And so whenever we generate those kinds of goods, we want it to actually be worth it. Yeah. Um, so we don't want to waste our customers' time or to make them feel like they're getting a lesser mm -hmm. product because we've adhered to these things yeah. up front. No, I love all these technologies because I think that they liberate a designer in a way too because it frees you up from, oh, I have this creative idea. Oh, I'm gonna get stuck in the weeds of the execution. And through technology like this at, the, at ACC, more creativity comes out of that, right? I know Absolutely. Nina gave me a tour and I was like, I didn't even know this existed. I'm trying to build a vintage fashion company that solves sizing body issues. And she told me all about Avametrics and I was like, yes. This is the coolest thing ever. <laughs> well, yeah. you, you can always have a tour. You guys can you always go. come visit us. <laughs> go tour. Anyway, so you're definitely equipping designers of the future, right? So aside from your three like distinctive brands, what are some of the other like local success stories that are coming out of Austin's fashion scene? I already talked about Sock Club. So All right. so, well, I'll <laughs> talk about SB. Yeah, um, yeah, do it. Esby is a local brand. I actually just attended their five-year anniversary. Um, they had this amazing um, fashion show. Um, yesterday, very awesome. right? Yeah, it was yesterday. It was yeah. really beautiful. Um, but no, they've they've really managed to manage their entire product development from Austin. They really started, you know, with our local Stitch Texas manufacturers, and now they've grown to a size where they've needed additional support. So I think they're doing more things out of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. um, we don't. We're not saying that working with Los Angeles or New York is a bad thing. We think that you know scalability is really important, and getting support from wherever it happens is really important. Um, but you know, whenever you work. Um, so far away from those locations, what helps you cost-wise is people to manage some of those things locally, at least on the onset, and then to be able to scale into you know, a larger space. Right. Um, so for some people, that may be, mean going internationally as well, but we're really looking at what can we do hyper-locally that would really support business, and I think ESB's really nailed it. Mm -hmm. They've done a great job. And I think she's from New Orleans originally, so she was doing some production there as well. Nice. So um, uh, not not only have we talked about Stitch Texas a little bit, there's also White Star is a local manufacturer here yep. that does similar um, uh, sewing production. Um, I think those have both been great resources for local people, uh, local companies. Um, uh, there's plenty of people interested in design who don't have a design background but have an amazing idea. And having being able to go to a production facility and be able to talk to someone in person and show them your little sketch you did and to eventually make that into a really incredible product. I think just having those success stories like the manufacturers has been um, in production facilities, also like Trunkist has been really valuable and to be able to bring more products um, to the market. Yeah. Yeah, I know when I moved here three years ago and people found out that I was covering sustainable and ethical fashion, I would scroll through my Instagram messages and I would be like, oh, I've missed all of these messages because they were brands. Hey, I'm a sustainable brand. So it really felt like the community was emerging and they've become some of my best friends. You know, I think Purse and Clutch is a, another really great brand um, sourcing from artisans in Guatemala. Um, you have Miranda Bennett, who is recognized I would say internationally all over the world and she's doing plant-based dyeing out of her studio here in Austin. So there are really wonderful, wonderful stories here. Um, that kind of brings me to comparing and contrasting Austin with other cities. Um, what are some things that are done in other cities that you admire that you kind of wish Austin would do? Yeah. 
<laughs> well, I think that one of the things that I've seen um, in some places is that they'll actually subsidize, you know, um, yeah. adoption of new technologies. And I think that that's a huge asset for local manufacturers. Um, whenever, you know, I mean, it could be as simple as something that, you know, with, with homeowners, we see that, you know, no longer, but the government used to um, subsidize if you put solar panels on your house because now you're creating a lower footprint. Um, however, you know, I think that we've seen in other cities, you know, um, Canada does a really great job with subsidizing mm -hmm. um, costs for manufacturing and for design business. Um, we'd really love to see something like that where there's a bit more policy um, support behind um, and, and money support behind business here. Yeah, absolutely. I know DC has a program. Um, they have an actual hang tag that they've launched. It's called Made in DC. So if you're a designer there, you can get that certification and they're really supporting creatives in the community. Andy, let's have you My chime in. There's like a little bit different, but um, something looking more at the, the idea of, ex, of like the growth of fashion in Texas or outside of the main hubs mm -hmm. is um, the accessibility of fabric. Um, not only do we not have like retail fabric stores for yeah. like young designers who are purchasing fabric for, for retail to, to design a single garment and to make it themselves like students, but um, the uh, actual production of fabric. I mean, I know there's a lot of knitting happening in North Carolina, yeah. but um, fabrics, all of my fabrics are imported. I would love to use domestically produced fabrics, mm -hmm. but the limitations, there just are not a lot of companies producing them. Um, we have Texas cotton, they have the largest, you know, area of organic cotton, it would be amazing to see a uh, fabric being able to be woven and knitted here as well. Yeah. So that's something I'm like hoping for in the distant future can happen. Yeah, really keeping it local. If I had never had to go to a Joann's to buy fabric again, <laughs> it would be a dream. Joann's or Michael's Dilemma, <laughs> which one's nicer? <laughs> um, when I was, yeah, when we were in grad school, it seemed like the only option here in Austin, which is pretty terrible. Um, yeah, you shouldn't have to buy your fabric where you buy your like Mod Podge, <laughs> like that should not be a thing. Um, what uh, I, one great resource is the Carolina Textile District and the Manufacturing Solution Centers in North Carolina. They're mm -hmm. um, I think they, they're with the Catawba College, I believe, and they help, um, if you pitch them an idea, you can email them if you have an, an idea for a design you'd like to make or something and you give them a full pitch they can, and they choose it, they'll help you find local manufacturers in North Carolina because a lot of those mills or companies are like family owned. They don't have websites. You have to either like drive into the middle of North Carolina and find them or use, you know, one of these resources. So mm -hmm. it's a, it's a great way to get connected with, um, with finding local made in the U S companies like long family history lines of, of knowledge and experience. So, yep. um, that's one that I really, really appreciate. Awesome. Yeah, I think, you know, this world of on-demand fashion isn't really 100% there yet. So even for um, smaller designers in, in smaller towns, there are online resources. There's traditional incubators that are online. There's a company called Factory 45 that can help a designer through their entire apparel process. There's another company called Cara, I believe, and they're all online resources. So kind of until this happens, there are ways around it. Um, I guess the last thing that I would love to ask is what is one tangible thing that we as the audience can do to encourage hyper-local fashion and to make that happen in our cities? I mean, just like local food, like buy local, uh, try to see, try to align your values of what, how you value your clothes with the purchases that you make. Um, try to support local artists and local creators yep. and makers and, and just try to be more involved in the process of, of, of how you buy your clothes? You know, I think um, tech, adopting more technology. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be on the technology <laughs> stage on this one. Um, you know, I think that there's so many different opportunities for us to engage in the way that we purchase our clothing and to be open to new technologies to how we do that, whether it's 3D scanning um, apps available on your phone to increase the likelihood that you keep a garment that you've pur purchased online, um, or if it's, um, you know, just being open to the way that a designer is presenting, you know, their collection to you. You know, um, I think there's a lot of different opportunities to adopt technology in the way that we interact with local businesses. Just being an engaged customer and thinking about what you really value in uh, ethics and sustainability in regards to your apparel, mm -hmm. um, doing like research to begin to understand that um, and be engaged with your local brands and businesses. And also thinking about um, like here in Austin, we, we have a 
a relatively small number of production facilities, factories. It's likely that many of the products you buy locally are all made in the same place. Mm -hmm. um, so I, honestly, getting to know your local factories and what their 